crews search for the body parts of 51-year-old Martha Crutchley and her boyfriend, 32-year-old Joshua Ford, reported missing last Wednesday. believe Erica Sifrit and her husband Benjamin killed the Virginia couple. But now Erica Sifrit is telling police her husband shot the couple, dismembered the bodies, placed them in plastic bags, and dumped them in a trash bin. Both suspects are being held without bail. Tonight, no motive for the murders, and so many questions remain. If the allegations are proved true, what led the Altoona, Pennsylvania couple to murder? Both ran a business that assembles scrapbooks. Erica Sifrit, a one-time college basketball player. Benjamin Sifrit, a former Navy SEAL. And I hear him say, come up here. I go up there and he's like, take my picture. And he's holding their heads. It was an office party where Josh Ford and Jeannie Crutchley first met. Both were married previously and the two were instantly attracted to one another, despite a considerable age difference. They were two spirits who really had the same personalities. So when those same two personalities clicked, I don't think the age made that much difference to them. They just fell in love. Josh was a very successful mortgage broker and Jeannie was an accountant for an insurance company. After dating for two years, they moved in together, sharing a house in Fairfax, Virginia. The couple rented a condo for Memorial Day weekend in Ocean City, Maryland, a well-known resort town along the Atlantic shore. On May 28, 2002, as everyone returned to work after celebrating Memorial Day weekend, colleagues of Josh Ford and Jeannie Crutchley were concerned when the pair didn't show up to their jobs. When Jeannie didn't show up for work, her coworkers were really concerned, and that's when they notified the Ocean City Police. Police went to the rented condo and found Jeannie's car in the parking lot. It was obvious to the police that the car had been sitting there for an extended period of time. In Ocean City, with the sand blowing around constantly, the sand begins to accumulate very quickly. Nothing seemed out of place in the condominium. Jeannie's car keys were still in the condo, so were their clothes, computer, and camera. It was as if they went out for a walk and never came back. Neighbors at the condo didn't see or hear anything unusual the entire Memorial Day weekend. A background check revealed Josh and Jeannie used their credit card to buy drinks at the Green Turtle, a sports bar on Saturday night. Investigators found the waitress that served Josh and Jeannie. She recalled they were sitting alone. From there, investigators learned that Josh and Jeannie took a bus to a nearby club. One of the hottest nightclubs in Ocean City, where everybody just floods to, is Secrets. And that's where they were heading. The bus driver identified Josh and Jeannie from a photo lineup and said they were talking to another couple on the bus, a Caucasian couple in their late 20s or early 30s. Witnesses saw the two couples drinking together, and also saw them leave together. But there was no trace of Josh or Jeannie after that. Calling all units, A211 at 675 Main. Backup needed. Less than a week after Josh Ford and Jeannie Crutchley went missing, police were called to a Hooters restaurant in Ocean City, Maryland. A silent alarm went off after midnight telling police there was a robbery in progress. Car 36 responding. Upon the officer arriving, he finds a jeep backed up to the door. 
and two people walking out with armloads of stolen merchandise. The robbers. A man and a woman were arrested on the spot. This is what the male robber said, according to Detective Scott Burnell. They were so intoxicated that the male, the husband, says to one of the officers, thinking it would be okay, can't we just put it all back and we'll be cool? Benjamin and Erica Sifrit weren't your typical married couple. They weren't your typical burglars either. Benjamin Sifrit, or BJ as he was known, was a former Navy SEAL who had finished first in his class. Neither one had ever been arrested before, but inside their car, police were surprised by what they found. These people are armed to the teeth. She has a gun in her waistband. It's a 357 five-shot revolver. I mean, he's got a six-hour nine-millimeter that's fully loaded, ready to go. And then in the vehicle, there's a 45 caliber h &K combat weapon. So, you know, you look at, looking at that, they mean business. And the arresting officers discovered something else. Inside Erica's purse were the Virginia driver's licenses of Joshua Ford and Jeannie Crutchley. When asked where she got the licenses, Erica said she and BJ found them and denied ever meeting or even seeing Josh and Jeannie. In the back of the Sifrit's vehicle, police found ski masks and flex cuffs. It makes you think maybe they've held these people hostage or taken them hostage and they're holding them somewhere against their will. Investigators now had a probable cause to search the Sifrit's nearby condo. On the table outside the dining room, they find two spent bullets. Police also found evidence that BJ and Erica had lied to them. They find a stack of photographs, and to their horror, on the top of the stack is a picture of Jeannie and Joshua at the Secrets nightclub. One of the pictures in the Sifrits condo showed a ring on Josh Ford's hand. In another picture, taken two days after Josh and Jeannie went missing, Erica Sifrit is wearing Josh's ring on a chain around her neck. And when she was arrested for the robbery, police found that ring in her purse. Even more damning, police found in the Sifrit's possession a key to the Atlantis condominiums where Josh and Jeannie had been staying. Police were now certain that the Sifrits had something to do with Josh and Jeannie's disappearance. Investigators took a much closer forensic look in the bathroom of the Sifrits condo, and there, they noticed something. I saw some orange colored substance on the tile. I noticed a little bit running down the side of the um, shower stall. And when I saw that, I thought, well, you know, maybe this could be blood. They pull out the sink stopper, for the, for the washing sink, and they find all kinds of hair attached to it with blood and flesh. Investigators discovered a bullet hole that went clear through the wall into the next bedroom. This matched the two bullets found on the Sifrit's coffee table. On the large glass window inside the bathroom, crime scene technicians discovered a partial palm print Tests on the blood in the bathroom and on the mangled 357 slug found on the coffee table yielded a DNA profile. Investigators took samples from Josh and Jeannie's toothbrushes and hairbrushes to generate their DNA profiles. The DNA on the 357 slug found on the coffee table was Josh's. So that bullet had been in Joshua Ford's body at some point and then dug out or pulled out and kept as a trophy by the Sifrits. We didn't have the bodies, but we knew that somebody had met a very brutal and gruesome end in that room. Bullets test fired from Erica Sifrit's 357 revolver were compared to the damaged bullets. When faced with this evidence, Erica Sifrit made a deal with prosecutors. She agreed to lead them to Josh and Jeannie's bodies and testify against BJ in exchange for a reduced charge. She told investigators they dismembered Josh and Jeannie's bodies and put them in dumpsters in the neighboring state of Delaware, only 10 miles away. For investigators, this was a lucky break. Eight days after Josh and Jeannie went missing, parts of their dismembered bodies were found. Bullets recovered from Josh's body matched Erica Sifrit's gun. Josh's palm print matched the print on the bathroom window 
in the Sifritz condo. Incredibly, Josh Ford and Jeannie Crutchley were random victims for a couple of whom breaking the law had become a strange romantic obsession. But just when investigators thought the case had been solved, Erica came forward with a story they could hardly believe. Prosecutors made a deal with Erica Sifrit. If she told them the truth about what happened to Josh Ford and Jeannie Crutchley, she would receive a reduced charge. One of the requirements of the deal was that she had to pass a polygraph test. Originally, she told prosecutors that she had nothing to do with the murders, that all she did was help dispose of the bodies. Later, however, she changed her story. She admitted during the pre-test interview that she was more involved in the homicides than she had told us up to then. She admitted taking the knife and stabbing Jeannie. Erica also admitted the tattoo on her abdomen had a special significance. Following the stabbing of Jeannie Crutchley, she got a tattoo on her side in the same place where she stabbed Jeannie Crutchley. And that was so she could forever be reminded of that night. She was involved from the get-go. and She essentially admitted she ordered the killings. Uh, so based on that, you know, we couldn't, uh, couldn't continue with this deal. First-degree murder charges were filed against both BJ and Erica Sifrit. Each ended up turning on the other. As the trials approached, investigators struggled to find a motive for the crime. The couple owned a scrapbooking store called Memory Lane Scrapbooking, near a mall in Altoona, Pennsylvania. But two months before the murders, they began turning to a life of crime. The prosecutors say the Sifrits were hunting for thrills when they met Josh and Jeannie at the Secrets nightclub. After some conversation, they all decided to go back to the Sifrits condo for more drinking, conversation, and a dip in the hot tub. But the Sifrits decided to toy with Josh and Jeannie. Erica claimed her purse was missing with her expensive jewelry inside, and she wanted Josh and Jeannie to help look for it. But only BJ and Erica were in on the game. If Josh and Jeannie found the purse, they could live. If not, they would have to pay the price. When Josh and Jeannie didn't find the purse, BJ accused them of stealing it. Josh and Jeannie made a run for the bathroom and locked the door. They tried to escape, with Josh leaving his palm print on the window. The evidence shows four shots were fired. The first two went through the door and hit Josh in the torso. Erica said BJ fired the third shot into Josh's head. Prosecutors believe Erica fired the fourth shot towards Jeannie and missed, either accidentally or deliberately, as part of their cruel game. The bullet went through the wall into the adjoining bedroom. Erica told prosecutors she stabbed Jeannie in the abdomen with a knife. Later, when Erica brought some rags and detergent to clean up the blood, she said BJ was in the hot tub with the heads of their two victims. She said BJ removed the slug from Josh's head to keep it as a trophy. Over the next 24 hours, the couple dismembered the bodies, placed them in garbage bags, and put them in various dumpsters throughout Delaware. They also went to a hardware store to buy a new bathroom door and more cleaning supplies to repair the bathroom as best they could. Afterwards, the couple acted as if nothing had happened. Erica wore Josh's ring as a trophy, carried around their driver's licenses, and kept the slugs from the shootings. Erica and BJ were tried separately in the absence of any physical evidence against him, and the fact that Erica's gun was used in Josh's murder, BJ was convicted of only one count of second-degree murder. 
he was sentenced to 38 years in prison. Erica was convicted of both murders, and sentenced to life in prison, plus 20 years. Here is a clip from the interrogation of Erica Sifrit. He has seal friends. I definitely would not want him to know that I was here talking to you. And if I go up and testify, and for some reason you guys don't get him locked up, my family will end up like Joshua and Jeannie. Dead. Made them strip at gunpoint. And I was like, oh my god. I, I was like, had no idea what was going on. And he told me that Josh said, I was in the army, you were in the navy, why are you doing this, why are you doing this? And BJ said that he looked at him in the face and he said, see you later, he shot him in the head. Jeannie would not have been shot yet. She was just whimpering and she curled up in a ball and he missed her the first time. And the second time he hit her right here. For the record, she's gesturing at her left chest. She had curled up behind Joshua's body. I feel like I'm getting like really bad. Uh, do, you, do you take a break? Uh-uh, I'm okay. All right. Just, BJ told me she was just whimpering like a baby. What do you see in the bathroom? It looks like a bad horror film. There's blood completely soaked everywhere. There are spots that if you stepped, it would splash. There were puddles of blood. I'm laying downstairs and I'm like curled up on the couch, just petrified. And I hear him say, come up here. I go up there and he's like, take my picture, and he's holding their heads. Josh's head in one hand, and Jeannie's head in the other hand, and wants you to take his picture. And what was he wearing? Nothing. <laughs>